And now, for the first time ever on this platform and forevermore, please welcome, if you will, Reverend Dr. Alice Reed. <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much. It was a real honor to receive a Doctor of Divinity from our global organization, Centers for Spiritual Living. Um, I'm still trying to get my head wrapped around it, and I'm truly humbled by the distinction. And I'm, um, you heard we had a, we have a new member. <laughs> it's the Allen crowd, so you know that you know. Of course, it's born on a Sunday morning. <laughs> Little Avery joined us, and one of our family members uh, left us this week. Um, he hasn't been a member of our community for a couple of years, but I think he holds a special place in our heart, and so we said goodbye to uh, Aiden Greeny this week, who uh, made his transition. So we, uh, we have things to celebrate. We have things to mourn. And isn't that just life? That is indeed just life. As we, as we move through this, this uh, existence of ours, through this philosophy that is life-affirming. So the, this last Sunday, we've um, decided to dedicate this. And some of you might have little pieces of paper, and you're like, what? <laughs> we have uh, been wanting to hear from you. We've been talking about uh, divine discomfort, you know, we, we've been, if you've been reading the Science of Mind guides, that's really different than what you've used, you're used to reading in the Science of Mind. If there is uh, something that's on your heart, a question that you have about our philosophy, a question that you have about spirituality in general or our community, our ministers are going to hold a panel, and, and we're happy to answer your questions. And so I want to bring up to the platform... Uh, Karen was going to join us as well, Reverend Karen Allen, but unfortunately, or fortunately, yeah. she's welcoming little Avery into the world and uh, supporting Kay. So I'd like to invite up to the platform Reverend Carla, Reverend Judy, and Reverend Arpad. And we're going to pull our chairs up. And in the meantime, are there, if you have a question, forgive the voice from the back here, if you have a question, or uh, <laughs> thank you, love, if you have a question, uh, comment, raise your hand, and our ushers are ready to grab them, uh, take them from you, and they'll bring them up here, and we'll be happy to support you in your curiosity. Remember, we were talking about curiosity a couple months back. And so uh, we want to satisfy that. We have one? Well, while we're waiting, I have a question. So we have done this over the years at, at our center, years and years. At least once a year, we have a question and answer. And my beloved dad, Roy Dixon, he was always the one to say, I have a question. Do we, do we believe in reincarnation? Do we, well, actually, um, in the 1926 version of the Science of Mind textbook, Ernest Holmes gets very mystical. He talks about um, psychic, psychicness. He talks about sex. <laughs> and um, in the latest version of the Science of Mind textbook, I believe uh, Ernest Holmes says very clearly that he believes we have one existence. But he talks about its its nature is being permanent. So he doesn't say we don't believe in reincarnation, but he doesn't say we do believe it as the Buddhists do. Um, and is in that earnest way. Just so you know, he never got an answer. Every year he asked that question. Yes. But the, a better question is, do you believe in reincarnation? You know, this is our philosophy, this is our teaching, but we say we are open to all possibilities, all religious thoughts. So do you guys believe in reincarnation? Do you think that um, there is something more than what you are and that what you are needs a second go around? 
So what's wonderful about the science of mind philosophy and at this center and centers like ours is we don't tell you what to believe. We give you the tools, the spiritual tools, and then you get to make up your own mind. So I've made up my mind, and yes, I believe in reincarnation. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Um, do you have anything to add, or shall we go to the next question? All right, great. We have some more. Boy, they're coming up. Um, what is the one mind, with quotes, the one mind? You want to? Well, we talk about the one mind all the time, don't we? Because we believe that there is an oversoul that is the mind, and that that mind thinks through each one of us as individualized expressions of it. So we have the one divine mind, and we all have access to this beautiful, beautiful mind of God. Did you two want to add anything to that? Let's have one more comment, and then we'll go to the next question. One what? One mind. One consciousness. One spirit. One God. One universe. One individualized creative expression known as you. Allowing spirit to recognize and grow because of your experience. That's, to me, one mind. I have something funny to say about the one mind. So I was on a train ride down to the racetrack many years ago with several ministers. And uh, there was a rowdy group of people. Um, you know, they had been having party time and quite obnoxious. And I had two of the ministers turn to me and said, Judy, are you sure there's only one of us? <laughs> so it was kind of funny. I said, yes. Only one, individualized. And so the next question kind of feeds into that so we can kind of dive a little deeper. The inquirer asks, does ever live, everlasting life exist? If yes, then our transition, over, our transition over, would it not be going home to the divine? I'm going to start. And um, I'm going to say that one of the movements that I've had to do with my own mind is the thought that I have to go move my mind anywhere or I have to move my consciousness anywhere where in fact we are all one, we are always with God so that we are home with the divine right here in this moment, sitting here in this now moment and we are home with the divine when we transition and we are home with the divine when we give birth and we are home with the divine every other moment. And we forget that, don't we? We forget that we are one with spirit in everything we do. Jahaladeen Rumi, the 13th century uh, Sufi poet, says we are tasting the taste this minute of eternity, every minute, this minute. And Ram Das, his famous saying is, we're walking each other home. So we're already there. Um, I wanna take, go to this next question. Do we believe in karma in any way? Karma? How can you not believe in karma? <laughs> what you do, you bring back to you. What you believe multiplies. You can stop with the questions. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, think about it. How many times you go down this path and you're getting more of the same of what you believe and your life's going to hell in the handbag or it's going in the opposite direction. To me, that's karma. It's not conscious. It's not like a religious thought. It's just the way the universe works. You know, what you believe to be true manifests, period, whether you believe it or not. You know, it's funny, a lot of people get upset about things and they like to keep score. And, you know, in our philosophy, we believe that, we, you know, what we 
what we're thinking and what we do and our actions, we all reap whatever that repercussion is. So the universe is the one that is looking out for all of us. We need not worry about what's going on with any other individual but ourselves. Um, there's <clears throat> another related question, which I don't think we'll answer from the panel because it's been answered, and if your question hasn't been answered, um, what are your thoughts on near-death experiences? Do you find them strong evidence for a spiritual realm? And I would say that in everything that we've just discussed, um, I find it to be very true. I, I think many of us ministers who have been counseling others or supporting people as they transition, there is something energetic that happens when somebody leaves this earthly plane and leaves their body behind. And I think many of us have had some kind of experience with that in our roles as ministers, and it does give strong evidence to that. Something that <clears throat> I heard a long time ago, because we have a lot of near-death experience stories, and people come back and talk about them. And something that just made sense to me is, as you're going down this tunnel, whatever it is, what you believe about your life all comes manifest in that moment. And then there's something else. And no one has ever come back from the something else to return to this world. So what you believe again is what happens in that moment that we all read about in that tunnel of light or vision is what you personally believe to be true for you. And then to, for me, then there's the something else. So hold on to that for a minute. Um, because. Uh, you know, our topic this month has been divine discomfort. And here's a question for each minister. What did you think of this monthly topic? <laughs> they want to know. They do. No, that was my question. <clears throat> uh, I had a hard time with the topic. You know? It's like, why am I talking about this? You know, but I became divinely uncomfortable preparing for it. I guess there was something to it, and it just unfolded the way it is. So, you know, we come on Sunday just for the glory and the joy, but the, we also have to come on a Sunday to get in touch with the things that hurt and don't feel good. And this presence, this church, this philosophy, these ministers are all here as a tool for you along your way to make change, good or bad. I was uncomfortable. It made me very uncomfortable, <laughs> divinely uncomfortable. Um, yeah, I had to push through it, you know? Um, and then, you know, it, that's life, though. You know, when you talk, had to put, you know, pain pushes you through it, you t your talk, and then when you spoke about the divine d discomfort, uh, it, um, I, I like to come here on Sunday morning and I like to read my stuff and I always like to feel high because of it and get lifted up. And this, I thought, well, this is going to be a downer. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, it wasn't. I gleaned a lot of liz wisdom and a lot of understanding. And uh, had this past month, there's been several ups and downs with uh, some of my clients and people I know. Uh, lots of joy, lots of sadness. Um, so that's life. That's life. And sometimes, darn it, it's uncomfortable. And we move through. And we continue on. Always continuing on. You know, I think discomfort is something that none of us are really at home with. But what I love about this philosophy is that we don't deny that we're having human experiences all the time. It gives us tools to work through all of that, all of that inertia in our lives. And I think that we have this opportunity to, to really embody who we are as human beings and this philosophy and move through what we need to 
for no matter where each one of us is. I've got a question for you guys. What do you think? <laughs> I mean, loved it. <laughs> loved, it. All right. loved it. Refreshing. Refreshing. Loved it. Do it again. What? We will. <laughs> All right. <laughs> we will. I, you know, I haven't. You know, I had two Sundays to tell you what I thought about this topic, um, and then I had a whole week in uh, South Carolina to look at things that have in the past made us uncomfortable. Um, we spent a week uh, in Charleston, South Carolina, where the uh, slave trade really, where, where most of the enslaved individuals from Africa came into this country. And so we celebrated black history and we gave voice to uh, I would say what is, I, I'll call it a pain body of the African Americans in this country who, whose history has been um, buried because it's too painful. It's too painful for, regardless of the color of your skin, the history in this country of slavery is too painful for us to own. It's very easy to put it aside. And so I felt like the, the daily guides gave me a greater depth and understanding of what that felt like. And, and I felt like Dr. Andriette, who also spoke at the conference for a little bit, um, gave us a sense of what it feels like to carry that around and to, and to live in this philosophy regardless of that pain body. And, and actually how it changed her and how it changed the heroes that she spoke about, how they rose up into their magnificence and spoke their truth in, um, in times when it was not okay to do so. So for me, I loved this theme and, I'm, and it's, it's actually gonna, I'm gonna take this into the next question is since we create from subconscious and conscious thought, how do, we, how do I clean my subconscious? And for me, you know, you have to name it before you can heal it. So it, I, I, maybe, there's, maybe there are people in this room who have a better, have a different experience with um, what I'll call the things in the subconscious that are unhealthy. I have to bring them up, look them in the eye, and then they dis and then ch and treat myself with love, and then they dissolve. That's how I deal with the things in my subconscious that are not um, for my best and highest good or the best and highest good for other people. I do a lot of what I call shadow work. Um, not as much as, as before because I, I tend to own it as soon as it comes up. And I'm willing to do that because transparency is a glorious place to reside. And um, when we have things in our subconscious that are unhealthy, uh, it's to be clear and to see them for what they are is really important. I'm gonna add one more thing and I'm gonna pass it to the, the rest of the, my peers here. We need to be careful not to villainize or blame somebody because they get cancer or because somebody they love died or because they've experienced some other tragedy. There are four ways that we create. We either um, promote it, we um, create it, uh, we allow it, or we step in it. <laughs> and when we step in it, we have another opportunity to create, promote, or allow. And so the things that happen to us are not because we're bad religious scientists or we have a dirty consciousness. Sometimes they just happen. And there's no meaning at all except the meaning you are given an opportunity to make of them. Subconscious is a big topic, isn't it? You know, I think one of the things that really, we really focus on when we're teaching the first year is just taking some time to sit back and listen to ourselves. Listen to the thoughts that are creeping through us and really take an inventory, take an inventory of, is that really my thought 
or am, is that coming from somewhere else? And really dialoguing with that, because there is a truth that rises above each one of those, those creeping thoughts that come in. So I invite each one of us to do that, because there's a lot of set in subliminal, deep conscious, subconscious things in our minds that we aren't aware of, but they're really directing how our lives turn out. When I first went to college, all alone, away from home, you start to grow up very quickly. And I realized my conversation with the people around me is I didn't know how I felt about a topic until it came out of my mouth. <laughs> and I go, oh, I believe that? I think that way? Because what you're told is one thing. What you say out loud and you hear it is something else. And I don't know, it was interesting just to make the connection that I was either more of this or less of that or greater or whatever it was by hearing out loud it got my attention, <laughs> and it's, anyway, that's all I gotta say. If I react to somebody or something I hear with uh, judgment, anger, or resentment, then I know there's something within me that needs to be brought into the light. And uh, it's something that's in my consciousness, maybe don't even know it's there, but if I, and reacting to those three different things, and then it, we, then it is there. So that's when I go into meditation or go into prayer to bring whatever issue that is, whatever made me feel that way, to the light of truth. And only when something comes up to the light of truth can it be healed. We push things down for years because we don't want to touch it and we don't want to see it. But it's there. And we have to bring it up so we're transparent. Yes, absolutely. So it's, and that's why we have practitioners <laughs> to help us along that way to see the truth for us. And, and that's why we have classes, and that's why we have um, our uh, family circle, our friendship circles, and that's why you come here on Sunday morning, and that's why you have prayer partners, be because the... So, say that again? And shifting, sands. and shifting Sands and Book Study. These are all opportunities for us to see ourselves, right? Because oftentimes we are looking at life through our lens, but we don't use a mirror to see ourselves in that. And so the, this philosophy and all the tools that we have give us the opportunity not only to see ourselves, but to see how we are at, you know, behaving out in the world, there are um, two questions here that um, I think we're addressing in this. One was about the, the mourning for people that are affected by war. Isn't this the two-year anniversary of the war in Ukraine um, today, actually? And then one about being um, overwhelmed with ill health. Um, those are the things that we have to deal with. Those are the things that we move through. Those are the things that we have an opportunity to to deal with. I have been, I'm going to phrase it this way, and I haven't seen it this way. I'm starting to see it this way. I have been blessed with chronic sciatica pain. And the reason I say I've been blessed with it, it's been about five years, you know, and around three and a half years, I'm like, damn, <laughs> like, how do I, how, what the hell's in my consciousness? You know, I went that thing of blaming and shaming myself and, and I, you know, I try all kinds of things outside of myself and I'm still working with it. But the reason I feel like it's a blessing is because I would not know what it's like to deal with a chronic health issue unless I had the experience. And now I have greater compassion. And now I have a different outlook and now I have a different perspective. And, um, now, and I can look at how I choose to walk through it, right? Do I choose to walk through it with, a, um, you know, looking at... I, I choose to hold it as something temporary, even though it's been five years. Um, and I know that it is, um, um, you know, well, I'm not going to gauge your health thing against my health thing. I'm going to say that there's always an opportunity for us 
to find support, to look at ways where we can support ourselves. I think a lot of my pain has to do with lack of self-love and self-care. You know, that's where I keep coming back to. And so I have a greater opportunity to love myself and care for myself. Um, and I don't know what, what's, what's your, what the jewel is when you're suffering, but I do know that there's always a jewel there for us as we choose to be open-minded and move through it. I don't know if you have anything else you want to add to that. Um, there are a couple of uh, personal questions. What path brought you to the ministry? And if that's probably longer than a short answer, but maybe if there's a short answer, you can. I have a short answer. I said yes. <laughs> I went to a church, Jack, Dr. Jackie's church. You've heard this many times before. I feel like I'm home. Uh, my daughter had a place to uh, ground herself in spirituality. And then a class came along. And then the class voted me the speaker, Mr. Shy Guy, me the speaker, to talk about the class on graduation. Then I said yes to another class. Then I said yes to another class. Then I said yes to another class. <laughs> and now I'm a practitioner. And I gotta stop saying yes. <laughs> and then I became a minister twice. So I don't know. I said yes. This well, let's. Mm -hmm. Oh um, yeah, same thing. Um, started taking classes. Loved the classes. Had to be in class all year long had to be in class, kept going on and on, and Dr. Jackie um, was my practitioner, and then she said, oh, you're gonna be a great minister, and I laughed, <laughs> laughed, laughed at her, and then she left in 99, and Dr. Heather came, and she said, I said, well, what other classes can I take? Ministerial training, I said, oh, no, I don't wanna be a minister. Go ahead, I'll just do the training. It'll be fun, you know, <laughs> so did that. Did the, did the panel, did the interviews, became a minister 20 years ago. Um, never regretted it, but because of what the science of mind philosophy and the center did for me personally in my life was magnificent, uh, showed me a way to live that um, is beautiful, and I thought how lovely it would be to share that with other people, so that's why. Well, I had no idea. <laughs> but our stories are all similar because what we were talking about in our, I think I have the first talk this month, is that vision pulls. And it pulls and it pulls. And it knows the direction that it's taking us in even when we don't know that direction. And we are willing to step up and say, yes, everything changes. Absolutely everything. Uh, my path for ministry, uh, I, I, I say this tongue-in-cheek, but I really mean it. It's been remedial. And what I mean by that is that I struggled with making the time for my spiritual growth. I struggled with not, you know, I'm, I'm a doer, and if you give me a project, boy, I'll sink my teeth into it, and I'll do, and I'll do, and I'll do, and I'll do, and I'll do. And what this philosophy teaches us is how to be. And so it was remedial for me. If I was to become a practitioner, that would mean that I'm committing to a daily spiritual practice. If I become a practitioner, I'm committed to praying and raising others up. And then when you get into ministry, you're making even bigger commitment that you're gonna stay on your growing edge. Like, we didn't go to ministry school and then we were, check that box, I'm done. No, it, it keeps us on our growing edge. It gives us tools, and, um, and there's a vow of some sort, a vow to be a constant growing and evolving expression of God and to share that opportunity with others. And so that's just a beautiful... I mean, when I was ordained, I remember they asking me why, you know, of why I wanted to be a minister, and I said, it's the best job in the world. You get to love people unconditionally. That's, that's just beautiful. That's just beautiful. I just have to share this one story. 
in practitioner school, okay? We had to prove demonstrations. Prove demonstrations, be a practitioner, okay? So you had to do your thing. And my wife says to me, wait a minute, let me get this straight. The Catholic Church requires two demonstrations for sainthood, and you need three? <laughs> Well, let's, let's thank our panel for this wonderful morning of answering the, your questions. Thank you so much. We're going to move these chairs to the side. I had one question that's personal to me that I thought I would uh, answer before we, and then I'll pray us, give, do a closing prayer. What does a doctorate of divinity mean, and what did you do to complete this goal? You can't, it, I did, you can't sign up for a doctor of divinity. You can't like sign up for a bunch of classes. It's, it's not like an academic doctorate. Um, we give, we being Centers for Spiritual Living, our global movement, gives doctorates to individuals who have been in high service to our organization who have been in high service to promoting the science of mind worldwide, who have been in high service to the internal uh, movement of Centers for Spiritual Living. And so um, I was nominated and then selected by a committee who looks for individuals who um, are all in and really give a lot to promote our movement. And so I was, I'm really humbled to be recognized by my peers with this honor of a doctorate of divinity. And there's a certificate that says it a little more professionally if you want to read it that's in my office. <laughs> but now let's go ahead and just do a brief prayer. Just take that brief, that, that brief breath in and out knowing that we are present in this now moment, that the movement of mind and heart is the movement of God, it's the movement of spirit, it's the movement of principle through our lives. So as we continue on this pathway of living this philosophy of the, the uh, religious science and the centers for spiritual living, what I know for each one is that we stay curious. We continue to ask questions, we continue to dig deep, we continue to create that safe space for us to allow ourselves to open up to a greater good that wants to express itself by means of our life. And I know that that, that uh, movement of spirit, that movement of love and compassion that moves through us individually goes out into the world and lifts others up so that we have these beautiful concentric circles everywhere. Each individual here and listening to the sound of my voice or in this sanctuary is a center of peace. And so I claim right now that that peace moves outward into the world and that we are indeed a blessing, a blessing to ourselves, to our family, to our community, to our state, to our country, and to our world. It is the gift that keeps on giving. So we say thank you in gratitude for all that we are and for all that we give. And so it is. <laughs>